right, well, church, today is part three in a season and a teaching series that we have been in called The Secret Place. Has anybody enjoyed The Secret Place, just by the way? Um, has it been a dud or has it impacted your life? Has it been helpful? I hope that it's been helpful. Today is today's part three, and we like to begin um, the year as a church, and our, our custom is to do something along the lines of prayer and I'm seeking after the Lord as we begin a brand new year, and this year has been no different. And we've been in this season in the series called The Secret Place. And in parts one and two, um, I've done something very different that I've never done before, just to try it out on you. But I introduced a parable, a, a fictional story um, that I wrote to help illustrate a certain man's journey to finding the secret place. And so today we're actually going to end his story and I'm going to pick up from where we left off last week, and I'll have three parts for uh, his story today, and then we will uh, conclude um, his story. This is, this is how it goes. He sat impatiently, his right foot tapping speedily on the front porch steps. The late afternoon sun peeked through the willow oaks on the front lawn. A gentle breeze swept across his face as he waited with anticipation. And as he sat, he thought, I think this is the first time I've smiled in a few days. Cat still wasn't communicating, but Mary was on her way. And she let Cat and Molly stay with her uh, since they had left to go uh, to get away. And Cody hadn't seen Molly in three days. Big brown eyes, a full head of dark brown, wavy hair. She was 15 months old now, and Cody knew they should arrive at any moment. And as a little white SUV pulled into the drive, Cody hurried out to meet them. And through the rear glass, he could see little Molly in her car seat. And as he opened the door and made eye contact with her, she smiled and abruptly exclaimed, Dada! At this stage, she still wasn't saying many words, but these had been her first that she had spoken just a few months earlier. Cat always gave him a hard time about that. Mary didn't seem too amused to be there, but as he lifted Molly in the air, spun her around in his arms, Mary watched and couldn't help but let a small grin form. Before she drove away, she said, I'll be back at seven to get her. And Cody couldn't help himself, and he blurted out, how is Cat? She's okay, I'll see you at seven. Well, well tell her I'd, I'd like to talk soon, he uttered as she closed her car door. It had only been a few days, not much had changed, but Cody could tell he had changed. Yes, he, he still had a lot of questions, still a lot of concerns, still wrestling through moments of frustration and anger and despair, still very unsure about what was happening, even more unsure about how to respond to what was happening. It seemed the only thing working was what Jermaine said, to pray. Cody wasn't a very religious guy, but he couldn't argue with how his prayers, particularly last night and this morning, had begun to do something inside him. The title for today is this title, Stepping Away. And for part three, we're going to look at the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. We're going to look specifically at the Gospel of Mark in chapter one. Join me there if you would. And we're going to be in Mark chapter one, and we're going to look at a, a, a unique little episode in the life of Jesus and his own pattern and his own practice of what it would look like for him to even step away in a culture, in a society, in a season of his life that was unbelievably busy. A lot of hurry, a lot of, a lot of things happening, and we see a Jesus practice in the text. We see this in, in Mark chapter 1, and I'll begin in verse 29. It says this, And immediately he, or Jesus, he left the synagogue, and he entered the house of Simon and Andrew. This would be also uh, known as Peter and Andrew, the brothers, would be uh, his, his followers, with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever. She was desperately sick. And immediately they told him about her. And he came, Jesus did. He took her by the hand, and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. 
I just love this about the life and the ministry of Jesus. And Jesus was always filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, and he could step into moments and with the touch of his hand could literally transform someone's physical condition in a moment. And Jesus, as he is in Peter's home and his mother-in-law is desperately sick, about to die, and some of the other passages in the Gospels reiterate how significant of a situation this was. And Jesus touches her, and the touch of the touch of his hand actually heals her, and he lifts her up, and she begins uh, to serve them. And then the scripture goes on to say in verse 32, it says this, that evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. Can you see that? Are you there? Can you imagine being at at Peter's home and, and, and everyone has heard what happened to Peter's mother-in-law, how Jesus had touched her and she was healed. And now the entire city, I don't know how many people this is, but a city typically is pretty large. An entire city comes to the home, Peter's home, and they begin to surround the home and they're bringing all of their friends, their neighbors, their children, their relatives, all who are sick and even some who are oppressed by demons. The whole city was gathered, and verse 34 says, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases, and he cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. This isn't really the nature of the sermon today, but some sicknesses are physical in nature, and some sicknesses are spiritual in nature. And Jesus would enter almost any context where he found himself, and he would do the work of the kingdom, working miracles, healing people in a physical sense as well as in a spiritual sense as a foresign of the kingdom that he was participating in, that he was bringing. And then we see this, and this is kind of the main point of the text. We could, we could go hard in the paint on the healings and all the things that had happened, but this is the main gist of the sermon for today, beginning in verse 35. It says this, And Jesus, rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, any uh, morning people out there, just by the way, we got how many night owls we got in the house, just out of curiosity. How many night owls hate the morning people? How many... <laughs> How many, how many night owls are married to a morning person? Probably most of you. Rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed. He got out of there. He departed. He got away. And he went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Simon and those who were with him, they searched for him. <laughs> They're like, we just had a great night last night. I mean, the, that was like the best ministry night ever in the history of the world. It was amazing. But now where is Jesus? And everybody's trying to look for him, trying, trying to find him. They're searching for him. And they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. Hey, Jesus, people need you. What are you doing? You can't be going out on walks in the middle of the morning and getting away. We got work to do, okay? This is, this is the kingdom of God. This is the ministry that's happening. We need you. And he said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. Verse 39 says, and he went out through all, throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. This uh, text gives us a beautiful comparison and contrast between what I've been calling the public place and the secret place. See, Jesus, like you and me, much of his life and much of his time is spent in the public place. It's where we, it's where we work. It's where we do life. It's where we, it's where we do family. It's, it's, it's our home. It's, it's in the community. It's hanging out with friends. It's, the majority of our time is actually spent in the public place. And here we get a little window into Jesus' life and into his ministry, and we see specifically the demands of the public place. See, the demands and the needs of the public place never end. See, one of the things that you need to recognize about your own life is that the public place is always going to suck the life out of you. There, there's more demands and there's more needs than you actually have the ability to fill in the public place. The public place never ends. It, it never ends. You're never going to get it all. You're never going to make everybody happy. You're never going to be able to solve every situation and, and every problem. There's always more and more demands. And the public place will always demand more of you than what you have to give. You feel overwhelmed. You feel spent. You feel like you just, 
You're like, what is going on with my life? Well, the reason is perhaps because you have devoted yourself to the public place and it is stealing from you to the degree that it's actually unhealthy now for you to be in the public place to the degree that you are in. The public place and the demands and the needs of the public place, they never end. And for Jesus' ministry, he even knew that there was always one more person to feed. There was always one more person to heal. There was always one more person to to touch because the public place is demanding. And there's nothing wrong with the public place. The public place isn't like a bad, awful place. You know, I'm not inviting you to, you know, build a commune and escape from the public place. The, there's nothing wrong necessarily or evil necessarily about the public place, but, but it's going to be demanding. Um, it, it's also going to be distracting. It's going to be con- consuming. And that's what the public place is. I'll, I'll say this. this is, I'll put this on the screen for you as well. The greater the demand of the public place, the greater the need for the secret place. See, in, I don't know exactly what season of life you are in, I don't, I don't know if you are a single mom with three kids trying to figure it out. I, I, I don't know if you are a business owner. I don't know if you are a teacher. I don't know if you are retired. I don't know what your situation is like, but the greater the demand of the public place, the greater the need for the secret place. The greater the need for the secret place. And for Jesus, we, we, we need to... Forget this idea or this myth that, that spirituality was easy for Jesus. Well, he's the son of God, for crying out loud. I mean, he like knew everything, right? I mean, like, and he could do whatever he wanted, and he could just snap his fingers and things would happen. We, we need to be careful to think that the spirituality and even the spiritual practices were, uh, were easy for Jesus. They were, they were not. Jesus, we could even argue, was, had greater demand on his life and greater needs in his life than you and I. And, and G, for Jesus, the secret place wasn't easy. It was actually challenging. It, it was hard for Jesus to fulfill his purpose in the public place because of all the demands that came along with it. And it wasn't easy uh, to find the secret place and to create the secret place. And if you're new, the secret place is, as what the scriptures have, have referred to and what we've talked about is, the secret place is a place of refuge. It's a place of shelter. It's a place where you run to. It's a place where you escape. It's a place where you go and you hide. It's a hiding place. And a place where you go in order to be filled up and to be renewed and restored and to be ready for the public place. And the problem with many of us is that our secret place and the places that we run to actually aren't filling us up for the public place. We're so spent out on the public place that we actually try to run and escape and hide and find something in the secret place that typically is some kind of harmful relationship or substance or practice that actually doesn't even help us for the public place. It does the opposite. And, and for Jesus the, and for you and me, the secret place is an intentional stepping away, not because it's easy, but because it is needed. Now, here's what I love. And Jesus, um, and I don't, I've never actually been to Israel. I hope to go. It's on my bucket list. Um, but I hear and I've seen pictures. But um, the Middle East is, is very arid. It's, it's, it's dry. It's somewhat of a, a wilderness. And there's the Sea of Galilee, and there's different cities and, and towns. But uh, much of the landscape is, is, pretty, um, is, is pretty dry and elder um, um, or, or a wilderness kind of place. And it says here, uh, Mark in his gospel tells us that Jesus withdrew, he got away, he escaped, and it says that he went to the desolate place. Now, if you look up uh, this term in the Greek lexicon, which I know you will do this afternoon, um, the, the, the translation for this word desolate, it's a largely uninhabited region. To be desolate means it's not populated. It, it means no one really lives there. It, it's uninhabited, and it can be translated as desert, um, which is where we get our word deserted, It could be translated as wilderness, and it could also be translated as lonely place. And here's what we see. This wasn't just a one-time event for Jesus. This was his regular practice. So for instance, Matthew chapter 14, uh, the feeding of the 5,000, that story, it says, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. And after Jesus had dismissed the crowds, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was still there, 
alone. Mark 6, said, they didn't even have a chance to eat, and Jesus said to his disciples, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. Luke 5, 16, when Jesus heals the leper, it says he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. So for Jesus, his secret place was a desolate place. It was a place that he had to go to. It was a place that he had to run to in order to be refilled, in order to meet the Father in a, 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 a significant, special way. Obviously, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere, but Jesus needed to withdraw in order to be with the Father in a one-on-one -on -one sense. And so for Jesus, he finds himself in a desolate place. Let me give you three quick things about what the desolate place is, and these will apply to your life as well. Here's number one. The desolate place first is a place of silence. It's a place of silence. Do you know there aren't many, more, there aren't many places in our world these days that are actually silent? It seems like there's so much noise, so much chaos, so much chatter. The desolate place is a place of silence. It's a place where you go that's the elimination of noise. The noises, you, you begin to, you can begin to cut the noises out. I mean, quite, quite literally, literal noises, but then as well, even, even mental noises. And the desolate place first is a place of silence. And then here's number two. The desolate place is a place of solitude. It, it's, it's a place of solitude. It, it's, it's, an, it's an escape. It's, it's getting away. It's, it's a place where you can eliminate the distractions. Does anyone else struggle with eliminating distractions in their life? Um, this dang phone, you know, you love it and you hate it. You, you, you kind of you you need it, you kind of have to have it, but then it's, it's kind of like, do I have it or does it have me? And if you're anything like, if you're anything like me, um, I mean, it's like the buzzing in, in, in the pocket, or if, 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 if you, I don't know if every, I don't, do women, I'm not, a, I'm not sure if everyone, does everyone put their phone in the pocket? I don't know, but I, I have my phone's in my pocket. And the buzzing, the incessant buzzing. And then I've heard, I've done some, I've done some research, and uh, apparently there's like phantom buzzing. Yeah. Have you heard about this? Like, so literally, like your body is so used to the buzzing of the phone that even when you don't have it, your muscles trigger that, that feeling and give you the sensation that your phone is in your pocket. And you're like, oh, I, I, thought, I thought my phone was ringing. My, my phone's, I do that like a dozen times a day. I'm like, I've got, I got major problems here. I got... But the, the desolate place is a place where you can, it's a place of solitude, you can eliminate the distractions. You know, and I've, I've kind of asked you over the last couple of weeks, what would it look like you to, what would it look like for you to have two minutes of no distractions in your day? What would it look like for you to have 10 minutes of no distractions in your day? 20 minutes, whatever you can do. But it, the, the, the desolate place, rather, is a place of solitude. And then thirdly, the desolate place, is a, it's a place of secrecy. It's a place of secrecy. Um, it's, if, if, the, if it's a, a place that is the elimination of noise and the elimination of distractions, then it's also the elimination of others. <laughs> it's getting away from even others. It's, it's stepping away. It's a place of secrecy. It's, 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 a place, it's a solitary place that you can even be um, alone. And Jesus, um, as he does quite often, he gets away and he, he gets away and he doesn't tell anyone where he's going and he finds a place where, um, I'll say it this way, the secret place is a place where only God can find you. And you go to find God and you go to seek him, but it's also a place where only he can find you. Now, I've, I've, I've said over the past few weeks, it's, if you're married, don't do this, okay? Like, tell your spouse where, where you're going. But, but find a secret place. Find, find a place that's, that's secret, that's, uh, that you can get away, that you can go for a walk, that you can close the door, that you can find um, a place. Even in Luke twenty two thirty nine, 39, Jesus, when he was on the Mount of Olives, he, it says that Jesus, he came out, Luke twenty two thirty nine. 39, he, he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. See, it was his custom, it was his practice, it was his regular thing. The Mount of Olives, when he was in Jerusalem, was just a little hillside outside the city. And that was a place where he would go often to, 
to pray. And even we remember at the end of his life, Jesus would go into the Garden of Gethsemane. It was a secret place for him. It was a place where he would get away. It was a place where he would find the Father, that he would spend time with the Father. And for him, it was his custom. It was his practice, which means the secret place wasn't a luxury for Jesus. It was a necessity. It was a necessity. It wasn't something that he would like get around to one day or, you know. No, it was like a necessity. Like he had to have it in order to be able to function well in the public place. And, and so Jesus, in order to perform well in the ministry that the Father had sent him on, it was necessary for him to get into the secret place to be ready for the public place. I'll, I'll say it this as well. Investment in the secret place positions you for impact in the public place. Yeah. Investment, spending time, investing time and energy, and heart and soul in, in the secret place actually positions you for impact in the public place. You wanna impact your, your marriage? You wanna impact your family? You wanna impact your community group? You wanna impact your workplace? You wanna impact your church? You wanna impact your city? Well, make sure that you're investing in the secret place so that you can actually have something to give when you're in the public place. We'll pick up on the story and the story continues like this. It was Sunday afternoon. The weather was perfect for lunch at Cody's favorite restaurant. He always sat at the same picnic table on days like this. It was the best burger spot in town. Smash burger, cheese, bacon, secret sauce, tater tots on the side. As he swallowed his first bite, he raised his head with, with a bit of positivity on his voice, and he said, she called. What? She, she did? When? What did she say? Well, Jermaine was the one guy Cody felt he could actually talk to. And Cody didn't open up much, but for whatever reason, there was a, a genuineness about Jermaine, something different about him. Uh, Jermaine had been checking on Cody. At least once a day, he'd call or he would text just to see how he was doing and see if there were any updates. In fact, just yesterday, Jermaine got a little more bold with Cody. Jermaine had learned for himself, um, even at his own lowest moment just a few years earlier, how he had found God. Jermaine had grown up in church, but it wasn't until his divorce that he really found God. Since that time, Jermaine had experienced healing and support from his church. The people were genuine. There was always a strong spirit in the room. It wasn't perfect, but Jermaine had found it to be his stability over the last few years. And it was just last night he asked Cody if he wanted to join him for church the next day. To his surprise, Cody accepted the invitation. Cody admitted he didn't know much about church. He asked what to wear, when to show up, and a couple other small little details. Cody felt a little bit awkward about going somewhere he'd never been, but he also felt a sense of value that someone would care enough to invite him. And sitting at lunch after church, Cody answered Jermaine's question. Well, she told me she wanted to work things out, but a lot was going to have to change. She shared what she had been, how she'd been feeling, and she opened up about her experience in our marriage. Wow, that, that's good, man. What did you say, Jermaine asked. Well, I honestly did a lot of listening. It was actually weird. For days, I imagined I would tell her all the things she'd done wrong, but as I listened, I had a similar feeling as when I've been praying. And Cody had never had so much free time as the last week. Typically, he worked long hours and he had plans most evenings. He was always on his phone, either scrolling social or catching up on work. There was never a spare moment just to pause and think. It seemed the busyness never ended. So what did you tell her? Jermaine asked. I just told her I had been doing a lot of thinking and reflecting over the past few days about my own issues. And I was honest about being upset and angry, but I told her I knew I needed change. See, like Cody, you and I can have a tendency to be consumed with a busyness, consumed with going and going and doing that we don't make time to pause and reflect and to receive and to spend time even in the secret place. And here's the reality about our culture. Our culture and in this society um, is obsessed with the public place. Everything is on display uh, the, the American mentality is go, 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 perform, perform, perform. 
there's kind of this cycle of ambition and drive and conquer and, and do something and, and then you get burned out and so then you escape and then you try to find numbing. It's the evidence of a disordered life. You and I as followers of Jesus, for those who've crossed the line of faith and are followers of Jesus, we now live and we operate according to a different kingdom. We aren't operating according to the kingdom of this world, but we're operating according to the kingdom of God, which means our lives and our practices should mirror the kingdom of God, not that we're perfect, but we embody a different kingdom in the kingdom of this world in which Jesus would say we're salt and light, which means there are always aspects of our culture. Everything in culture isn't bad. Um, I'll say there's some things where we have convergence with culture, meaning we can converge and we can agree and we can, we, can, we can join with the culture. But there's also moments of divergence from culture where we have to di- diverge. We have to do something different because it's actually not a part and an aspect of the kingdom of God. So when our, when our, when our culture is, 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 is valuing things like justice and equity, what do we do? We say that actually is the kingdom of God as well, and it may be different, and we may not agree on everything, but actually, we should be people that pursue justice and and equity. And and then when our culture um, has a certain mindset, even along lines of like sexuality and sexual practices that are different from the kingdom of God, then then we have to diverge from that and say that's actually not kingdom, that that's not the way of Jesus. And, And then even on a topic like this and busyness, busyness and calendar and scheduling and go, go, go? Do we, do we converge with that in the culture or do we diverge? We have to diverge. We, we have to demonstrate and emulate a different kind of practice than what we're seeing in the rat race of our culture. That, that Jesus followers are, are people that have ordered lives, not disordered lives that we're intentional with our time and our effort and our families and we, we look at our priorities and we prioritize God above all and then, and, and then family and, and then church and, and then work and others and so on and so forth, that we represent and we emulate to the world um, an ordered life um, that, that, that's a counter culture to our society's concept of busyness and go, go, go. And in so doing, we represent a different kingdom. And rather than be empty, throughout our day, we're filled. We're people who are filled. We're people who receive from the Lord. We, we get filled up in the secret place. We receive what we need from God. We get our, our purpose, our identity, our, our meaning, our significance, our, our strength, our power from the secret place. And then that allows us to be filled in the public place rather than be empty in the public place. I think that so many people in our society live empty lives. The shell looks nice, the the shell looks, maybe the shell performs well, but on the inside, there's a sense of emptiness. A couple weeks ago, I read this story about um, Billionaire's Row. It's a place in London where literally there's this street that is lined with dozens and dozens of unbelievably huge mansions. It's called Billionaire's Row. As I would read the article, it's quite fascinating that over a dozen of these mansions are actually empty. Cobwebs are coating the walls and ceilings are are crumbling and uh, outdoor swimming pools are actually drained and bedrooms are, are gutted and kind of made me stop and think, are we living lives similar to that? Where we have a shell that, and a facade that might look a certain way, but on the inside, we're living a life that is empty. It's important that we, <clears throat> like Jesus, step away. We find the desolate place. We, we get out of the public place. We withdraw, we get away. We resist the temptation of more, and we go and we fill ourselves up. We resist the temptation of hurry and busyness, and we prioritize the things that are most important in our lives. I love, <clears throat> I love what Pastor John Mark Comer says on this. He, he says this, hurry isn't just the sign of a disordered schedule. It's the sign of a disordered heart. And we have to ask the question, um, are our lives disordered, and are they disordered primarily because of our schedule or primarily because of our heart. Read the story, even heard it last week, and then had a member share it with me this morning of um, the the prominent Charles and John Wesley, brothers 
a couple centuries ago, become one of the most significant, impactful leaders in in uh, Protestantism. Actually, the Methodist Church and the Wesleyan Church actually find their roots in these two men, John Wesley and Charles Wesley. If you would read the story about their mother, her name was Susanna. She was the mother of 19 children. (laughs) That's like a nation. (laughs) If you would read her story, um, she would have this incredible practice where Obviously, it's almost impossible to have a spare moment, to have a free moment, to have a moment of solitude when there's 19 children in the home all demanding something of you. And the story goes, if you'd read her story, she would take her apron and she would literally, at any moment throughout the day, she would take her large apron and she would just pull it over her head and drop to her knees in whatever room she was in. And it was her sign to her children that she was in her secret place. And she would stop and even in a busy day, even in a chaotic day, uh, she would stop and she would pray and she would spend time with the Father. And I just have to wonder if the impact of John and Charles Wesley is more due to their mother's prayer than their own intellect and ability and skill. That they had a mother that, they had a mother that saw the need to be with the Father and to get with him and to be filled in him so that she could operate and function as she would need to in the public place. Cody's story would end like this. As she sat in the driver's seat, her fingers clasping the steering wheel, she wondered if she was making the right decision. Molly was in the back seat and their, their bags were stowed in the trunk. It had been a brutal few days, mentally and emotionally. This felt like it was going to be a make or break moment. With the radio off, she assured herself they could work it out. And Cody was standing on the porch when she arrived. He helped unload their bags and get everything in the house. As he closed the door, he he said, I'm glad you're back. I'm really sorry about everything. Kat replied, I'm sorry too. Cody knew it was gonna take some time to repair things. There was going to be much to rebuild, but he was ready to to make it work. She noticed he, he wasn't holding his phone. She couldn't even see it as she scanned the room. And as she stood there looking at Cody, she couldn't help but ask, herself or or ask, what's happened to you? You seem different. What do you mean? Cody asked. Well, there's just a different spirit about you. Positively. I I mean, oh, gotcha. That's good to hear. Cody said, well, I'm not really sure. It's, it's, it's been a hard few days and Jermaine has been really helpful. And he told me I should pray. I know this may sound weird, but that's what I've been doing. I'll come down here early in the morning or either take a walk. If my mind is racing And I've been talking to God about all this. And it's like I found something that was missing. I never knew I needed this, but it's now clear I can't do this on my own. As she stood there listening in disbelief, it was as if he was a different person. She felt awful for leaving, but it was clear Cody needed to find something she could not provide. And whatever it was that Cody had found, she felt she needed it too. Church, would you bow your heads with me as we reflect? <clears throat> I'm kind of curious what your story would be today. Your journey, uh, finding God in the secret place, experiencing him in the secret place, drawing from him what you need in the secret place place. I just want to speak life over you today and faith and that God has given you exactly the amount of time necessary to do what he's called you to do. You can prioritize him. You can pursue him. You can find him. You can say no to things. The public place is always going to be demanding more of you. You can say no in order that you can say yes. And you can find and experience God in that place. With your heads bowed and eyes closed as you reflect in this moment, I'm just curious if you might be here perhaps today and maybe you are unsure even about your relationship with God. Uh, Maybe you're not even sure about what it means to follow Jesus or even know him. Scriptures say that Christ came for us 
that he, he lived the life that we could not live. He died the death that we should have died and he conquered the grave that we could not conquer. And in Christ, through faith, we receive salvation and forgiveness and life in the Father. We, we trust and we submit and we surrender our lives to God. Have you ever done that? Do you have that kind of relationship with God? Have you ever made that decision? I'd encourage you today to make that decision between you and God right now in your seats. You could say, God, today I decide to trust you. I decide to give you my life. I receive you. I trust what Christ has done for me. His life, his death, and his resurrection. And today I receive your salvation.